Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan MSP. So we're going to go through the extra nuggets to do with the war in Ukraine. This is not a map update, but this is my Ukraine war update extra, where I give you the context and those juicy tidbits. Right, we're going to start with uh, Italy and Silvio Berlusconi. So he's the three-time previous uh, or former Prime Minister of Italy, known for his corruption and also his close friendship with Putin. There's been this controversy over the last, well, basically since Italy had a general election and a coalition made up of two far-right and one centre-right party went into went into power. Uh, Maloney, who is the head, head at the moment, has publicly stated she is supporting Ukraine, which is obviously great news. Uh, it was expected there might be a bit of a problem because on that right in Italian po politics, there is a lot of support for Russia. And in fact, there's been really controversial stuff coming out that I've reported on previously concerning, say, statues of Mussolini being found and loads of sort of fascist uh, bits and pieces that that some of the uh, the top people in, in the government have been found to possess. But also that Berlusconi has admitted that he is one of Putin's top five friends and they've exchanged sweet letters to each other recently and, and Putin's just given him for his 86th birthday um, a whole bunch of vodka and he's sent Putin uh, Italian wine, so on and so forth. And now there's been the serialization of some audio recordings that have been leaked that give you a, a, a bit of a window into Berlusconi and his beliefs that basically it's all Zelensky's fault and he's hook, line and sinker swallowed the Russian narrative. And if if he is in coalition in Italy for power and if his party, Forza Italia, have the foreign minister, I think, then um, this is this is A, embarrassing, but B, a bit of a problem for supporting Ukraine in the long term. So Silvio Berlusconi has claimed that President uh, Zelensky quote, provoked Russia's invasion of Ukraine, triggering a fresh political row and threatening the stability of Italy's new government. So in the latest clip published by La Press Agency on Wednesday, Berlusconi can be heard defending his old friend Putin and saying that Zelensky provoked Moscow's invasion by tripling the attacks against the Russian-backed separatists in Donbass. And here's what some of the audio says of Berlusconi. The republics of the Donbass eventually sent a delegation to Moscow and told Putin, please defend us. Putin was against any initiative, but he was under a big pressure from the Russian people. And uh, so he invented this special operation. The plan was that his troops had to enter Ukraine, overthrow Zelensky and replace him with a government formed by a Ukrainian minority formed by honest, sensible people, of course. Uh, Berlusconi added that when the Russian military invaded Ukraine, they were, quote, faced with a situation Putin could not have predicted. A resistance from the Ukrainians. Hang on, me interjecting here. How can he think that Putin had invaded and that they wouldn't predict that Ukrainians would be kind of annoyed that they're being invaded by a, by an aggressive force? Of course, We've talked, to, or I've talked a lot about this, which is the idea that actually that is what Putin and the Russians thought that that they would just waltz into Ukraine and take over the country because they'd be welcomed with open arms. But you know that's obviously not not what happened. But it's this idea that anyone could actually be as easily duped as Putin. And of course, if you're in Putin's pocket, then that, that's no surprise, I guess. So faced with a situation Putin could not have predicted of resistance from the Ukrainians who started receiving money and weapons from the West, and the special operation uh, became a 200-year war. Uh, so he sees that Putin and Zelensky won't get to the negotiating table, quote, because there's no possible way. Zelensky, in my view, forget about it. I can't say. So that's interesting. I wonder what he would have said there. Um, there are no real leaders in the West, continued Berlusconi. I can make you smile. The only true leader is me, spoken like a true uh, narcissist. So this and, and much more just goes to show how uh, fragmented the, the unity behind support for Ukraine potentially is around the world and in certain parts of Europe. Take Viktor Orban in Hungary. And uh, here in Italy, 
uh, Italy's one of the biggest economies in the world, and this this is this is embarrassing. Uh, it's been embarrassing for Italy. It's a problem for European unity, and it's a problem for Ukraine going forward. Now, a really interesting comment that came on one of my videos yesterday, and I'm going to point this out because I think this is relevant to this. This is in a field says, and and thank you. There are so many great comments on my videos. I, I, I want to take the opportunity to say this, and I said this, pin my comment about this, saying this that that is. YouTube comment threads are just cesspools of invective and, and insults. But actually, generally speaking, the comment threads on my videos have been really, really uh, constructive. And I have to thank you for that. Really impressive. So so thanks for, for your, the thought and time you put into these things. But in a field here, so strategic, speaking strate strategically, it's more important that Russia pulls the EU apart than it is for Russia to occupy a couple of extra count counties or states in Ukraine. If I were Putin, I'd be thinking about this. For example, I'd be encouraging or supporting China taking over Taiwan. The EU will collapse if it sanctions China. Without a China attack on Taiwan, Putin is dragging out the war and pulling the EU this way and that while hoping for a freezing winter in the EU. Such a good point. And in fact, generally speaking, these kind of things here are wins for Putin. Okay, he can. You can talk about whether Bakhmut is going to fall to the to the Russian forces and all that kind of stuff, but it's that's kind of irrelevant compared to things like this, which is really what Putin's about, which is uh, sowing discontent and discord in, in the EU, in NATO and in the US politics and in UK politics. The, these are wins for him. This is more important than, you know, what the troops are doing in certain parts of Ukraine. Absolutely. And I, and I completely, completely agree with that sentiment uh the cnn report uh says pretty much the same thing but it you know this is uh berlusconi uh, trying to excuse himself to the italian press everything was taken out of context yeah of course it was and um, it was circulated without knowing the global meaning of my words with the only scope to spread disinformation and lies i don't deny my past friendship with vladimir putin that brought important results which were achieved in full accord with our western allies but today the circumstances have changed. You don't believe that for a second. This has just happened. You know, he's he's been in contact with Putin just now. This isn't like something from the past. So watch your space. Uh, I think it's a bit of a problem. Right, change, complete change of what to think about. I love this. I, I've watched it over and over. It's just like mesmerizing. This is a welcome to Ukraine. This is a Ukrainian helicopter j just flying down the highway. And uh, I don't know, it's just... Quite interesting. Just uh, welcome to Ukraine. There you go. I'm just driving down the road and a massive military helicopter is flying at lorry level. You know, at the level of, of these vehicles. It's just flying down. I don't know why it's doing that. Possibly it's just having a bit of, uh, bit of fun time. It, you know, it's a tough war. It's nice to have a break and uh, be silly for a bit, including incredibly dangerous flying down a highway. Right, let's move on to this guy who I reported uh, a week or so ago. He was a Russian who was on top of a, an infantry fighting vehicle that crashed into a wall during a fight. And the Ukrainians came and got him out. But he was saying, you know, go away, just leave. Or he was saying, just kill me, do me, I, I'm done for type thing. So here, here is a crash wall and here's a guy and his leg was trapped and he was just saying, you know, kill me. And this Ukrainian was saying, that's not how we do things. And slapped him around the face and said, like, get over it. I'm, I'm saving you. And he asked the, the Russian, you know, what were you? And he's a doctor. And he's like, what are you doing? Being a doctor, you're supposed to save people, not kill people. And it was an interesting um, video that. Anyway, it turns out that he's now been, he, you know, he's recuperated. Ukrainians have looked after him. Well, this could be a PR stunt, of course. Uh, a, a sign to a message to other potential Russian uh, surrenderers and people who who might think it's better to surrender and live than than serve and die. Uh, but at 19 minutes into this interview with him, and here he is looking a lot lot healthier. I was responsible as a doctor for three companies. He said about 100 soldiers in total. Imagine the amount of losses. In 10 days, 10 soldiers remained in each company. 
So there you go. We can imagine, says this, uh, says the Dead District uh, Twitter handle, uh, what the meat grinder was in the Battle of Kupi- for Kupiansk. So he, that's where he was. He was captured around there. Anyway, there's a there's a full um, interview with him, and uh, as as they say here, Ukrainians saved him, and he feels good in Ukrainian captivity. And you know, I do believe that Ukrainians do look after their their troops in line with the Geneva Convention. That's what they've claimed, and not only because it's the right and moral thing to do, but also because the optics would be terrible if they treated them as badly as the Russians. The Russians don't seem to care about optics, so they just do what they like and treat people horrendously, uh, as we have seen um, and continue to see. And in fact, we're going to be talking about that in a second. Okay, so we go on to uh, a little excerpt from Ukraine, the latest podcast, and this is um, a Sergio, a um, reporter who's been on the front line in Kherson, and he's also been up in Kharkiv, and he's kind of comparing the two. And what he has to say is absolutely fascinating here, and in fact, I'd love to play you so much more of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to the, the the bunch of minutes I've got in, in mind. But this is really interesting. Kilometer away should take cover uh, there's shrapnel flying around everywhere and, and he's like you guys got pretty close like he's like there's nowhere else to go this it's a kilometer away as the russians so just to, yeah so just to let you know he's just been talking about how he's only a kilometer away from literally the russians the russians are a kilometer away and he's in Kherson, and there's fighting going on around and he's he's seen uh, a bunch of stuff seeing it from that perspective i can tell you that there's a couple of differences from Kherson to the Kharkiv counteroffensive because I, I covered both one of them, the most striking one, is the terrain is different. Right? It's not forest. Kherson is huge open fields. And because of that, even these liberated villages, when you're driving between them, you're pretty exposed. I mean, it's not just you in a car. I mean, anyone's exposed, the tanks, the convoys. Um, and that's really striking. I mean, it was a clear, beautiful day. And dr- just driving between liberated villages, we saw a fighter jet, you know, twisting in the air. I saw anti-air defense really close by, knock something out of the sky, and it, it's over before you even know it. Know it. I mean, it literally shot, exploded, and it looked like somebody put their cigarette out in the blue sky. And you hear artillery uh, almost nonstop. And what's interesting is when you're driving between villages, if you look to your left, you, we saw smoke kind of hitting positions. Look to our right, we saw smoke hitting positions on either side of the road for kilometers in the distance. And it was just like, wow, the front line is super active in many directions. And um, the other interesting... So just to, I just wanted to show you, this is the Kherson region he's talking about. And you'll notice it is just almost entirely fields, agricultural fields, okay, which is completely flat. And there's there's no uh, forest around here. And so what, what this means, so for example, there's an area down here at the bottom of this Kherson region next to the, uh, next to the, the sea, the Black Sea. Well, actually, it's the sort of delta leading into the sea um, and the Inhulets River that comes down here. The, uh, uh, no, from uh, Mikhailov, it's not the Inhulets River, sorry. Um, but anyway, this, this area of land here, where it's a kind of a no man's land the the russians are sort of back here a little bit and the ukrainians are here and no one's here because as soon as you set foot here you can just be so easily seen that artillery takes you out and so the, some of these little villages are just slap bang in the middle of a whole flat areas of field which is very dangerous uh and you send some drones up and you can see movement really easily uh, there's no cover and this is partly why it's been so difficult to take this area um, because it is flat uh, agricultural land. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. The thing was there was a lot of trenches that we passed that were Russian trenches, and I got to go inside some of them, and we were just kind of looking at the different the different ones. I mean, there were some that were pretty – there was zigzagged, and then there were some that were in a straight line for hundreds of feet. And we know now, you know, since from World War One, like you don't dig straight lines in trenches because – you know, shrapnel can go through it. It's easier to target. You know, if a drone's hovering overhead, it's, that's a very easy task for a drone. Um, and I, I've seen plenty of videos that I wouldn't be able to show with you uh, because they're too sensitive. But I've seen one row, just a straight line trench, is just had loads of dead bodies in them of of Russians. That it's just 
yeah, it seems like that they do they do have zigzag trenches, but they also have these straight ones that are just very easy to to take advantage of. So it's just it, it, it was just kind of this very lazily dug fortifications in some cases, and there was dead Russians still on the in some of the trenches outside the trenches. Um, in one case, there was a, a commander who had been uh, who's still laying on the ground, and uh, we kind of stopped there to to look at him and look at the fortifications. And soldiers would pass by and just kind of glance over and you know kind of smirk and keep driving. Hey, I'm Casey from Mosaic. Oh, that's so annoying. Uh, and a bit of a uh, an advert there. In the trenches, you know, I, I saw a, a pot of stew that with a spoon still in it. And I was just taken back by like how, you know, how recent Russians were fighting in these very trenches. Um, the officer we were with was telling us that that they had cases of guys who would. Um, stick their legs out of the trenches hoping to get shot and like the, the ankle to get pulled out of the front lines. He said that some of them were, were so poorly trained that recently uh, uh, mobilized that they just, they would, they would put up a, 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 the appearance of a fight. But when Ukrainian forces got close with, you know, with tanks and um, with uh, drones and, you know, the, the combined, the combined arms is, is um, Dom calls it like they would start retreating. That you know they, they would put up a fight when they're in the distance, but close by they would just pull back, and and um, and I'll just show you a video that confirms this kind of approach in a second. And the other thing too about the trenches, not to belay this, but belay this point, but they were so they were they were so narrow, like they were dug uh, thirty centimeters is is what we we measured, which is I mean. So for those still working in Imperial, thirty centimeters is about um a. Uh, a school ruler length is this you know about 12 inches um so if that's how deep the trenches are goodness me that's not very high like you, you have to lay down in them basically to get cover and it just shows you like what poor discipline and what like you know that is not a serious effort to to either protect your your troops or to really hold that position i mean 30 centimeters is quite is quite short um um and then you know moving away from that stuff I can tell you that the biggest takeaway was that this is not inevitable for Ukrainian forces to win this counteroffensive. I mean, I saw an American Humvee uh, on the side of a, of some trenches that was blown out, and the Ukrainian soldiers were like, "Yeah, that was a that was a Shahid Iranian drone that hit that last week." And it just makes you think, like, "Geez, you know, that is a you know that's a pretty good piece of equipment." These are the, these lines where I'm standing at that moment were, I thought, pretty secure, and they were just like, yeah, no, the you know the drones, they're they're you, you look up like they, they might be around here somewhere, and um, some of the villages are right on the Dnieper River, and you can literally see the you know the opposite side of it, which is the Russian occupied area, and you get told right away like, look, if you're going to go in and out, you know you got to watch out because they can see you. There's mortar fire in the area. Um, the residents were saying that. Have you heard of texture? Oh, again. Saying that, you know, this stuff happens in the middle of the day, you know, kind of midday is the worst time. So much to talk about. Thank you so much for that overview. And there's loads more in that interview uh, where he talks about the Russian occupied. He was speaking to a lot of locals and how the Russian occupation of these villages and, and towns in um, Kherson were, it was run like the mafia and that how cruel they were. And that it's all about this one guy who, uh, one commander who was, he was cruelest to the weakest. So the people that didn't show, show great strength, he'd pick on them even more. And uh, it was talking like lots of stuff. Uh, very interesting. Anyway, Ukraine, the latest, well worth looking into. And it's this idea as well that, that warfare is becoming an aerial drone warfare these days. The importance of drones has been emphasised or shown with great clarity in this war so it's not uh, not just about drones like the shahid loitering munitions that go in the attack and and blow things up like that humvee which is a pretty pretty armored piece of piece of equipment and the shahid can take that out and the shahid is cheap as chips compared to the humvee but um it's also 
the reconnaissance capabilities of these drones and satellites as well, but but drones that enable and the spot for the artillery and for mortars. He was saying, you know, you don't want to show your face on this side of the river because they've got they've got if they've got a drone up, they'll just shove a mortar from across that side of the river and 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 you're done for. Anyway, here's here's a here's a BBC reporter on the front line and the cameraman, the cameraman doing some crazy stuff here, just taking pictures of people who are firing their guns as they're being shot at. Uh, just but anyway um this this kind of backs up one of the claims that was just made by the previous reporter A grenade's fired into the tree line from where the Russians were firing as we make a speedy exit. Let's get out. Let's get out. Okay. We're getting out of here. I don't mind, I can back. They just came under some small arms fire, probably from a, a Russian scouting party, so they've been telling us to get out of here back to the main headquarters. Russian forces have been trying to outflank them. Many of these troops only volunteered at the start of the war. Months of fighting has transformed them into a professional army. But these counterattacks are slowing their advance. They come at us like cannon fodder. That is their strategy. As soon as we open fire on them, they retreat. But we need more armor to continue the assault. And we are waiting for reinforcements so that we can move forward. Fascinating. So the, this is the idea that the Russians uh, have a lot of mobilized conscripts who are used as cannon fodder and sort of go towards an att attack. Uh, but as soon as they're shot at, they'll just run away and retreat. And this is kind of what the other reporter for The Telegraph was, was saying. Here, by the way, I mean, this is a very interesting video as well, well worth watching in, in all. Is that they, they show quite a lot of um, bridge laying equipment that the uh, Ukrainians have to use because they're needing to ford loads of bridges that have been blown up, at, or not ford, create, build lots of bridges uh, to, to cross these rivers, how important they are. Um, but and here, this guy, the commander here, says that basically they've not been given many or any Western weapons, his unit, and they are. Uh, they, so they went into this campaign with just machine guns and they have got a load of extra weapons now, but they've got them on, the, on off the Russians. And he's saying that the Russians are the biggest um, don donors to to his unit and, and the campaign against them. And uh, he's sort of really proud of all the equipment that he's, he's taken off them. But anyway, there you go. Some interesting videos. Um, this is uh, to talk about Iranian sanctions. So in my uh, pre one of my previous videos, I talked about how the Shahid drones and Iranian drones are a real problem for the Rush uh, for the Ukrainians, as we saw even in uh, in that previous Telegraph uh, podcast uh, interview, where the guy was saying that uh, the Humvee was taken out by a Shahid loitering drone. So here the um, so in one of my videos, people commented and said, "Well, actually, someone said." Uh, because I talked about how that there were fewer drone strikes. There have been fewer drone, dr drone strikes kind of each successive morning where they seem to happen in, in daylight in the morning, but there actually haven't been as many since since the initial load that came over and, and basically took out a lot of the uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, energy infrastructure. And the um, one of the claims that someone made was like, well, there have been these sanctions put on by the EU and UK, and it could be that that they this has really affected the Iranians being able to provide these. But I say I I said no, I don't think that's the case because 
it's immediate, right? They've they've not got. I mean, these sanctions only came on in the last what day or so, and you've seen a drop off of these kind of loitering munitions being used, these kamikaze drones, and that's far more likely to be reflective of a running out of these. So they put an an, an order of two thousand five hundred to the Iranians, and that doesn't, you know, that's to be ordered. That doesn't mean they've got 2,500 sitting around. They will have a certain amount of stock, and then they've got to build the rest. So the sanctions might affect the building of the rest of these, but that's much more long-term than just what's happened over the last three or four days. So I think the sanctions, if they are useful and if they work, they might well affect whether they get the rest of of the order uh, going forward. But now it's going to be about using up the stocks that they have, and I just think it just shows that they probably don't have the stocks. The fact that they don't... Uh, that they have had fewer and fewer uh, attacks with these drones just to me would say that they they just don't have as many they're they're running much lower on them now um and here we in this is a uh, radio free U- europe um radio liberty article eu uk announced sanctions over iran's drone deliveries to russia and it says that some of the iranian staff uh, ch- current chiefs of staff and and a bunch of others have been themselves sanctioned as well as the uh, shahid aviation industries um now the question is will that really affect them and and, and their ability to make these things because they are they are co-opting commercial components that unless those are sanctioned too you know is i i don't know i don't know the clarity on exactly what's being sanctioned here but i don't and i i I don't know whether this definitely means they won't be able to make these going forward. My bet is that they will find out, find loopholes and still be able to make these things. I know that there, there's been an Austrian company that's been providing a lot of their components because they don't do it directly and it's it's legal. Uh, you know, they're selling these these things that, that are commercially available and this uh, company is then taking the components out of these other things and then putting them into these drones and kind of turning what are commercial things into into of different of different um machines into uh, a military piece of hardware now puts it this together with the fact that Iranian major general Yah Yahya Rahim Safavi has said about 22 countries have filed formal bids to purchase Iranian made military drones the current candidate con- countries for the purchase of Iranian drones are Armenia Tajikistan Serbia Algeria Venezuela and other countries this is really interesting so this war is basically a big showroom for military hardware and Russia was and I talked about this before Russia was the second biggest exporter of arms in the world but this war will have had an absolutely terminal um, effect on their arms industry because this is not showing Russian arms in, in any decent light. And there's going to be, there will be a lot of countries around the world that are looking at this war and going, yeah, you know, all those, those tanks we're going to buy off you, Russia, not too sure about them anymore. Might go somewhere else to get them. You know about this, you know about that, not too sure about that. However, Iran have come in, you know, Bayraktar have done really well in Turkey. Um, and and you'll have things like these Caesars and um, Crabs and Panzer Howitzer 2000 from around Europe. People would be going, oh, yeah, no, these, these look pretty good. Everyone's talking about them. And also these Iranian drones, cheap as chips, uh, but really effective. So no surprise that that Iran will do very well out of this. And then, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that they'll find a way of getting around these sanctions and not only pro- supplying drones to Russia, but but to many other places around the world. And just to carry on this idea, uh, so there, there was talk of, um, I reported yesterday, I think, that there were Iranians on Crimea supporting the use of these drones and training people technically and how to use them. Um, but now it's claimed that 10 Iranians helping Russia operate their drones have been killed in Kherson. And this is according to Ukraine, but uh, for, through the Jerusalem Post here. Um, now, that's really interesting. Then They're not just in Crimea. They're actually on the front lines helping them to to use these uh, these Shahid drones. Now, Ukraine says that they died uh, during strategic missile attacks. Um, but anyway, that's an interesting development. Talking about these drones again, there's been a German company that's confirmed it's now ready. It's already sent one of these radar systems. This is called the TRML-4D uh, and can detect 1,500 targets 
uh, you know, at once in a 250 kilometer radius, 360 degrees. Um, and these pieces of kit are really, really good. This is exactly, exactly what uh, Ukraine need, but they just need a lot of them. So it's great that Germany's come in and this company has in record time produced Hensolt in record time. It's, it's given one of these and is sending another three over. So they, they'll be building these two suites really. Uh, this this is is great because it can can detect smaller craft such as the Shahid drones uh, and you know what you then do with that information is another thing. So you then need stuff to take that out of the, out of the air. Um, there are things like the Iris T air defense system, which is an excellent piece of kit that the Germans have just given and I presume will be giving more, but that's really super expensive and it's, the missiles will be expensive. So really you want a load of these Jeopard I talked about, uh, loads of auto cannons positioned around to shoot these things out of the sky because I think it's far more uh, cost effective to just send a, l a bunch of auto cannon rounds up into the sky to take out these drones that the, the do fly they fly i think 111 miles an hour so they're fairly slow they're quite noisy so you can see them coming hear them coming um even though they are well they are quite low they generally fly low so you can take them out with small arms or auto cannons anyway that's great that that's coming it won't be a game changer but they need as much of this stuff as they can get the ukrainians okay let's move on to the horror kharkiv injured under russian occupation is now becoming clear torture was routine witnesses say police see the signs in the in the bodies they're recovering quote there are people with tied hands shot strangled people with cut wounds cut genitals you've also had um i think reports from the female pows that were swapped for russians that have, have come back people from avastel still works in mariupol and these female um pr prisoners of war have been saying that again the treatment and, and talking about torture and whatnot and i argue with people I've been arguing with trolls and, and pro-Russians uh, in the threads of my own videos. And I go, look, right, you're probably pro-Russian. In my head, I'm like, you're probably pro-Russian because you're anti-West. You're, or you're either a Russian bot, so you're just literally employed by Russia to go on these threads and just spread disinformation and lies and, and show, show that there's more um, or, or indicate that there's more support for Russia than there really is. Or you are someone who is genuinely anti-West, so anti-American imperialism, anti-UK and EU, uh, anti-West. And the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So if I'm anti-West, then I'm friendly with the Russians. I'm pro-Russia because I want the West to get, you know, uh, to, to, to crumble and fall apart. But the problem is, if you if you jump against that side and onto this wagon over here, then this wagon over here, if it's like really morally problematic, then you are by extension just uh, defending all all the, all the evils that take place taking place with this this group over here so in being anti-west and and whatnot you're saying right i'm pro-russia in this war but that means that you are supporting something like forty thousand um registered war crimes i mean is that really what you think i feel really strongly about this because right, and i try to call someone out on it and they refused to to entertain my question i was like they were just insulting me and saying this and this and whatever and i said no okay but just let's get this straight are you defending forty thousand war crimes oh it took, took the mickey out of me for saying that i said no 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 seriously i want to know are you supporting forty thousand war crimes and like you can say what you like about about these guys but in supporting these other guys you are supporting a morally terrible regime and and I, I want you to just express whether this is something that you sanction. Do you sanction these war crimes? And of course, they don't answer that question. Okay, so really, it comes down to that you know, like Ukraine have not done anything like this, nothing like this, and that's that's almost all you need to know. Just uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, this is fascinating and has been underreported and is really important for you, for you to know. So I'm just going to read out this Twitter thread about Putin's declaration of martial laws in the parts of Ukraine. So he's just announced martial law in the four districts, regions that he's annexed. But this guy says this is meaningless. 
He did something else today, much more important than telling. He introduced a kind of martial law across Russia in what looks like an effort to preempt the possibility of revol revolt. Here are the details. Most of Russia, except the pink and yellow regions of this map, was ordered under a state of basic readiness. In these areas, regional governors are authorised to strengthen the protection of public order and ensure public safety. Strength in protection of military, important state and special facilities and facilities that ensure vital activities. Strengthen operation of transport, communications and energy facilities and facilities that pose risks to life, health and environment. Four, introduce a special regime of operation at facilities listed under three. The two of Russia's federal districts closest to Ukraine, central and southern, yellow and pink on the map, are ordered under a high alert level. The gov oh, sorry, there you go. There's the, the map. The governors of regions in Russia's central and southern federal districts are authorised to take all the me measures listed above, plus five, restrict and inspect the movement of vehicles. Six, introduce control over the operation of transports and communications facilities, computer centres and automated systems, and then use them for defence needs. Crimea and regions of Russia that neighbour Ukraine, Krasnodar Krai, plus Belgorod, Bryansk, Kursk, Rostov and Voronezh oblasts are ordered under medium level of response, which is higher than high alert. Maximum response was reserved for recently annexed regions. Governors of these six regions, remember this is in Russia, are authorised to take all the steps listed above, plus temporarily resettle residents to safe areas with precision with provision to such residents of living quarters. Eight, introduce a special regime for entry into and exit from the region and restrict freedom of movement within it. Throughout Russia, each regional governor has discretion on the timing and particulars of implementation. Across Russia, each region must create an operational headquarters to implement the degree, led by the governor with representatives of the Defence, Internal Affairs, Civil Defence and Emergencies Ministries and the FSB, Secret Police and National Guard, the Riot Police. Since Putin's Russia is already a totalitarian state with very little allowed op opposition publishing, it's interesting that the Decree specifically targets publishing houses, including in Moscow, which is within the central, central federal district. Broadcast and internet media will be wondering if some of the vague terms such as communications facilities, computer centres and automated systems will be interpreted to apply to them. With public gatherings already closely monitored and suppressed, it seems likely that one of the main effects of the decree will be increased presence of armed men in public and increased monitoring of vehicular traffic. This is absolutely crucial this is re really um interesting to know that russia are doing this uh, and it looks like in the event that the mobilization and the war efforts go badly in ukraine and they you get some kickback from within russia that they are putting things proactively in place to stop that happening and and the thing about the internal security in russia is there are far more members of the internal security forces than there are the armed forces and that means that that to have a revolution in Russia is particularly difficult because they're such a stranglehold of the population. And once you control the narratives through the media uh, and the the internet uh, and and print media uh, being controlled and under sort of martial law, and once you have all of the aspects of society being being drawn under martial law, there is really very little scope for freedom in in Russia and, and the ability to um, to show any kind of dissent to the decisions decisions being made in in the kremlin anyway i think that's fascinating right next one uh people have been asking about dragon's teeth few people have said what are they these are dragon's teeth uh, and these are basic big concrete sort of pyramids placed in usually long straight lines to inhibit the fast moving of vehicles so i've shown you footage of humvees racing through fields and then dropping off troops so in these kind of thunder road incursions or really quick lightning offensives stuff like this slow slow you down now with massive lines of these across a field it doesn't take an awful lot to move them. It doesn't, you know, you just need some kind of excavation machine, some kind of digger to move these and then you can move on. So when you have several lines of these and you've got trenches as well, things then become slow. And I guess that's what the point is to slow down, to put speed bumps in the way of Ukrainian advance to then then to allow you to to then hit hit the Ukrainians as they advance because they've slowed down to kind of get their way through these defenses. Anyway, those are dragon's teeth. 
Um, going back to my video that I said about the US politics, and I know as soon as I do anything on US politics, I know there's a variety of people that watch this and there'll be lots of people who will disagree with each other and will disagree with me. I have my own political views, uh, which, you know, are going to be fairly obvious. But um, <clears throat> I, I'm trying not to alienate anyone. I'm trying, trying to just be as honest as I can. Now, when I was saying that the Republicans in the midterms might cause a bit of a problem for continual support of Ukraine, A, lots of people jumped on and said, actually, you need to consider this. And these are things I have considered in other videos, but let's draw it all together here. Uh, I'm not, you know, the Republican Party in America is is actually a spectrum of its of, of its own, and there will be certain people. That, and the thing is, don't shoot the messenger. All I was doing yesterday was saying, look, these are this is literally what the Minority House leader Kevin McCarthy has said. This is literally what people like Matt Gates, Matt Gates are saying, what the CPAC is saying, and all these, you know, some of the Republicans are saying that they will not give a blank check and they will not continue to support Ukraine with financial support in a way that they already have been doing. OK, so that's just come the midterms. This might be a problem. That's all I say. Right. But some people said some very interesting things which are worth uh, drawing together here. I mean, again, I've spoken about all of this stuff previously, but it's about synthesizing this. Okay. okay. Oliver Carpenter says, I reckon there will be support for Ukraine continuing after the midterms uh, in the USA for, for a few reasons. First of all, support for the Ukrainians is very popular and will likely be a big ticket item. I don't think it will be a big ticket item. I don't think people are going to be voting on that. However, he is right. I think there is there is about 73% support, if I remember correctly. So um, most most Americans still continue to support Ukraine to that degree. It's quite, it's quite uh, impressive. Despite some GOP representatives saying they want to scale back, I think this would actually make them look weak and would be reasonably unpopular. The length, So that is a good point. Uh, the Lend-Lease Act that the US is using to support Ukraine does not require House or Senate approval. It's just Biden and whoever the head of the Pentagon is making that decision on the financial support packages being sent. Uh, so it'll continue throughout Biden's tenure regardless. This is a really good point. So I talked about Lend-Lease and Lend-Lease is a way of bypassing the Senate. So you're a trifecta in, in America. You've got the president, but the president really can't do anything unless he has the, the Senate and the House. Right. So if you have all three of them, then you can make decisions very easily because your party controls all three of them. But if the if the rather like in the last six years of the by of, of Obama's rule, he had the White House, but he didn't have the Senate and the House. So he couldn't make decisions because the Senate and the House would vote against him. So in order to get around this problem, the uh, Biden introduced the Lend Lease program, which is last seen in 1941 in, in World War II, which is the ability to give um, equipment to, in this case, Ukraine, without having to get it sanctioned by the House uh, and the Senate. Okay, uh, And that means it doesn't need a sign-off, doesn't need a vote. He just gives them, them equipment. I'm not sure about the financial side of it, about actual funding, just like money. Um, and I think that would need to be signed off. Uh, but you'll probably correct me on that. But that is important. It is important to know that that even if the uh, the GOP got the 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 say, for example, the House, um, and all suddenly decided to vote against Ukraine support, then he, Biden could still use a lend lease program to get stuff to Ukraine. Okay, but. There's more points to be made still. So John Nairick says, as an American who tries to stay politically aware, even I was. Uh, so he's talking about some other guy commenting on this, another YouTuber, the, pointing out that the support in, in the US for Ukraine is about 73%. That's what I said. Also, while the GOP might be campaigning on cutting back on aid, it isn't a universal sentiment for all the members. Funding bills can get passed with all Democratic support and just a sprinkling of bipartisan Republican support. This is a super important point and absolutely right. So even if Kevin McCarthy and a bunch of Republicans say, right, we're going to try and put a spanner in the works for getting this stuff passed in in uh, in the American political system, actually, they're just an, a number of Republican lawmakers. Now, if as long as you have all the Democrats and then a few Republican senators or, or um, representatives voting with support for Ukraine, then that, that will pass. Those that legislation will pass, or, or policy, or whatever that 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 pack those packages will pass. So actually, this is a super important point. Yes, they can. A lot of the Republicans can say what they'd like to probably please their rank and file members, 
but in reality it won't really change the voting outcome but it's not just that um, finally, when we ha give military equipment to Ukraine, all of this has to be backfilled by new stock here. The defence industry is a solid, perhaps too solid, many felt in the past, contributor to the right wing. So this is to say that lobbying happens an awful lot in America, and part of the lobbying is a military-industrial com complex giving money to, he's saying in particular, Republican lawmakers to say you need to make policies that... I mean, this is what lobbying does. It's it's basically legalized corruption and bribery. Sorry, but that's my opinion. Um, which is to say that we are going is quid pro quo, quo completely. We're going to give you money as a politician, but if we're going to give you money, we expect something in return. So this might be the NRA, like with National Rifle Association. It might be healthcare providers and health insurance. It might be whatever, whatever the lobbyists are, uh, or gun control or whatever. You know, people people are given money by lobbyists but the expectation is if we're going to give you that money we want something in return so the military industrial complex will be giving money to certain senators and, and lawmakers and representatives to say yeah we're going to give you this money but when you make uh, your votes in in congress you need to vote in favor of the military industrial complex so if we are a big defense contractor or if we're a big defense manufacturer here's a bunch of money for you uh, we support everything you're doing um, and by the way, when you go and do that vote, we expect you to give support to Ukraine because that means sending loads of our equipment to Ukraine and then we will have to build more that will have to be pay paid for. Now, as John Nairik says here, um, they love the idea of increased spending for replacement equipment. Their wishes are likely to sway members who might talk loudly out one side of their mouth, uh, the other side of their mouth. So they might say, um, we're not going to support the Ukraine, but actually we are because I'm getting lobbied here. And what this does is it arguably it st stimulates the economy. So at a time of the cost of living crisis and, and a recession looming, then if you've got defence manufacturers making loads of stuff even if it's getting sent to ukraine you're still creating jobs and there's still a load of money floating around and so there is an argument to say that that actually there will there will be support for ukraine going forward because it's a it's a way of stimulating the american economy it's not just about giving money to ukraine and and america gets nothing in fact it's far more complicated than that anyway i hope, I hope that kind of explains and also talks about uh, you know, my my position was just reporting what the Republicans said yesterday, but it, but here's here's a more kind of nuanced uh, view, which brings me on to my final bit. I like to talk a little bit about psychology and all this kind of whatever. Uh, and tell me if you don't like this. If you do, it's the kind of stuff I do. Uh, anyway, motivated reasoning. Like, why do you come to my channel to look at to to listen to me? Why do you go to I don't know Defense Politics Asia? Why would you go to Rybar? What? It, is, is, uh, do, do you go to certain channels because they just confirm your view already? So if you're pro you, pro Russia, you go and search out the stuff that supports Russia. If you're really pro Ukraine, you go and support out the views, search out the views that support your pro Ukrainian view. Uh, the way that we process information um, is to activate directional goals by trying to confirm a desired conclusion. So this really explains what I'm trying to say. So I, there are two ways of reasoning. Motivated reasoning is about being motivated to reason a particular way. So you have a conclusion that's already there and you then try and argue towards that conclusion. Actually, you're arguing back from the conclusion. You're backfilling your, your rationale for that conclusion. Rather than starting with the evidence and building up and creating your worldview from the bottom up. So this is a bottom up approach as opposed to a top down. A top down would be motivated reasoning. You start with a conclusion or theory and work backwards. Bottom up is build up towards a conclusion. So here we have evidence using reason and logic. You you build that up towards a conclusion. And you you go wherever the evidence and the reasoning leads you. You don't start with a conclusion and then work backwards because you are already ending up you are already St you're starting where you'll end up. It's kind of circular. So this is, you know, motivated reasoning is desiring a conclusion and then finding motivate using motivated reasoning confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is evaluating evidence, giving a greater value to evidence that supports your worldview and a smaller value to evidence that doesn't. Or, or you attack the person that delivered that or, or wrote that evidence or has something to do with that evidence and you minimize it and make it smaller rather than treating evidence objectively and saying, well, this has this value and this has this value and therefore this is more powerful. You say, 
this evidence is more powerful merely because it confirms my worldview. Now, we all do this. It's really difficult to get away from this. I do this. I'm not saying I'm somehow different from you guys, but being aware of this is really, really important. So if you do, if you start with your conclusion, use motivated reasoning and confirmation bias, and you end up with an incomplete and low quality evidence. Uh, and it's just the way it goes. Here's a way, like, this is just really interesting to me. This has nothing to do with the subject. This is to do with like microchips or something. But this is a a good way of, of, of showing that this works all over the shop. So this is a bottom-up flow, which is correct by construction. So you're constructing from the bottom up. You option to customize, fill routine for different needs, building blocks, fill done at each level of construction. Okay, it doesn't matter what any of that means, other than it's this idea of building up as you go. And then you've got the correct construction because you've built upwards. But if you have a top-down flow, and it talks about microchips here, blah, 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 whatever, these last two are interesting for me. Run checks after fill to find hotspots. Fix hotspots where possible. If you start with the conclusion and then look for evidence to support that, your evidence doesn't necessarily knit together very well. And it's very poor evidence. And what happens? You end up having to fight in fire. You end up having to fight fires all the time to try and plug the holes and sort out your very rickety evidence that's been constructed from the top down and it's very um brittle often and it, you do that your your castle in the air can can often uh, tumble down because it's, it's, it's built on 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 either nothing or very, very thin um foundations i would always advise building from the bottom up bottom up where i'm not going to i don't want my conclusion to lead me what, what i want my conclusion to be I won't allow that to lead me. I'm going to build up my evidence and then end up at a conclusion. So a lot of talk to suggest, you know, have a think about uh, where you're where you're going with the way you, you look around the internet and the way that you evaluate different resources and sources. Why do you come to different channels? Are you going to a range of channels to say, actually, I'm going to go to a pro-Ukrainian, pro um, Russian channel and someone in the middle, and I'm going to try and use all of that to approximate something that's most accurate. Or do I put all my eggs in one basket and go to this real pro-Ukrainian channel who's just singing the praises of Ukraine and giving me all the good news? But of course, that might not that might make me feel better. It might be what I want to be true, but it might not, in essence, be the most accurate way or the most accurate information. And likewise, you know, for the other end of the spectrum. So anyway something to think about let me know if you agree or disagree uh, or whether you appreciate any of what i've said or not i don't know um anyway thanks so much for all your support uh please like subscribe share um and uh you can support my channel i'm a massive tea drinker i know some of you are supporting me to buy me a coffee uh someone said yesterday here's a couple of co coffees well tea uh, i hope you have pg pg tips gold and i was like no i'm a yorkshire tea drinker so anyway a bit of tea discussion there for you uh but um uh, if if you want to uh, buy some uh, stash the, to show your support for Ukraine, there's uasupporter.com forward slash ATP. And if you put forward slash ATP, you can go, come to here and you can, goodness me, you can get pillows and pillowcases and all sorts of stuff that show your support for Ukraine. Um, if you're pro-Russian, uh, this might not be your cup of tea, speaking of tea. Um, uh, good segue. Nice link there. Uh, anyway, thanks. If you do any of that, I get a tiny bit of uh, commission for that. That, but you know, just just watching and and being with me and uh, contributing so well in in the threads or or uh, or whatever is 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 great, and I really do appreciate it. Thanks. I will see you tomorrow. Toodle pips.